All right, so thank you very much for the introduction and uh, welcome everyone to this presentation. My name is Kim and I'm a software engineer at Logica Clocks. If you're not familiar with us, uh, we are a startup based in Stockholm in Sweden. And we are the folks developing Hopsworks, which is a platform for scale out data science and machine learning. So what we do is that we develop infrastructure for machine learning essentially, that's our trait. And like I was mentioned, I was supposed to be co-presenting with my CEO, Jim Dowling, but unfortunately he couldn't make it today. But I hope that you catch this talk uh, yesterday instead. So this talk will be about Databricks Delta, just like many others at this conference. But we have a very clear focus, and that will be on how you can use Delta inside your machine learning infrastructure. So I will try to structure this in two parts, where in the first part of the presentation, I will go over Delta like a background, what is, how does Delta work internally, and what is the motivation for Delta. But also we look at how Delta compares to other similar frameworks like Apache Hoodie and Iceberg. And then in the second part of the presentation, I'll try to explain kind of why we think that Delta is also a very good fit for building a feed store and for managing end-to-end -end machine learning pipelines. And let me elaborate on that last part a little bit. So if you're a traditional machine learning person, the way that your problems are set up is that you have these X and Y values, and then your task as a data scientist is to you know, model this data and learn the relationships between the variables and extract some patterns. However, this is not typically how your data looks like originally, that you have your data in this kind of clean X and Y values. Rather, you typically first have to extract the data from somewhere and transform it to get it in the right format before you can apply machine learning. And this is what we in the machine learning community usually call for feature engineering. And what we're seeing now increasingly as machine learning is getting a wider adoption in industry is that this process of just extracting the X and Y values and getting the data in the right format at the right time for applying machine learning is getting really complex. And some companies even argue that this is actually the hardest problem in machine learning, much harder than developing the actual models. So Uber, for example, are claiming this, and they are arguably one of the companies in the world that apply machine learning at a larger scale. So what they're saying is quite interesting. And it's also in concordance what we have seen with some of our customers. So for us, when we develop infrastructure for machine learning, it's very clear that there should not be a question mark up here. Rather, what we envision is that it should be some standardized interface for how you feed your data into your models for training and serving. A standardized interface between data engineering, which will compute the features, and data science. And that is what we like to call a feed store. And my topic of the talk today will be on how a feed store can benefit from frameworks such as Databricks Delta and Apache Hoodie and Apache Iceberg. So this is my outline. I'll begin by giving a brief introduction to our platform, which is called Hopsworks, just a general overview. Then we'll go into Delta and see how Delta works internally, what is the motivation for it, and also, like I said, how it compares to other similar frameworks. And then we get to my main point, which is how you can use Delta to build a feature store for machine learning. And we'll do a case study then on the feature store that we have built at our platform. And to make it more concrete for you guys, I'll also try to do a live demo to show you the feature store in practice. And then finally, I will summarize the presentation and just give you some hints if you want to try out the platform or just learn about it more. All right, so just out of curiosity, how many people in here have heard about Hopsworks before today? If you can get a quick show of hands. All right, uh, quite a few people, even though we have a very big room. So the way we like to describe Hopsworks these days, because it has evolved quite a bit over time, actually, is as a platform that provides infrastructure for doing machine learning at a very large scale. And what we mean by that is that the platform has a bunch of different ingredients that typically you need for making machine learning work on big data. So at the, <clears throat> and the platform kind of uh, distinguishes itself from many others by being a truly end-to-end -end platform. So we have the support for everything from data ingestion through Kafka, to batch and stream processing with Spark and Flink, to data storage, to model training, all the way up to model serving and deployment. And when we're trying to design this end-to-end -end workflow, our goal, our vision is kind of to marry great user experience for data scientists with uh, horizontal scalability. Because we are from a research group you know, in distributed systems, so we're expert at scaling out things, and now we're kind of trying to marry that with good user experience for data scientists. And let's now do a quick kind of bottom-up walkthrough of the different components that together make up this platform. So at its core, we have a distributed file system called HopsFS which allows us to store huge amounts of data for running our machine learning workflows. And we also scale out horizontally. So if you're familiar with, for example, the Hadoop file system, this is essentially a more faster and scalable version of that. 
On top of that, we have our own research manager for accelerating the machine learning workflow using specialized hardware such as GPUs. And here we support both um, NVIDIA GPUs as well as AMD GPUs. And we're actually one of the first companies in the world to support AMD's new platform called RockM. On top of that, we then have support for all of the latest machine learning frameworks, such as Spark, uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and Keras. And a few others like Scikit-Learn, XGBoost, and so on. And if we pause here for a minute and just consider this picture, I think this is kind of a standard stack for doing machine learning right now. This is slight variations of this is what many companies are using on-prem and also what the major cloud vendors are offering. But the interesting thing with our platform is that this is just the foundation that we build upon. On top of that, we then have developed several abstractions for helping our customers manage their machine learning workflow. So we have a feed store for managing the feature data. We support pipeline orchestration using Airflow. And we have an experiment service for making uh, machine learning reproducible. We also support one-click uh, model deployment on our serving infrastructure. And all of these abstractions are then made available to our data scientists through high-level APIs that they can call from inside notebooks or jobs running on the platform. So if you're a data engineer and you want to search something in the feed store, you would use the feed store API. If you're a data scientist and you want to run a machine learning experiment, you would use the experiments API, and so forth. And when I was preparing these slides, I was told to kind of keep it high level, don't go into implementation details. But I couldn't help it from mentioning one thing, which I think is very cool with our platform that kind of makes it stand out. And that is, it's all built around this distributed metadata layer that actually persuades throughout the entire stack. So we have metadata all the way down from inodes in the fund system up to features and models used in machine learning experiments. And all of this is kept in the same distributed database, which is consistent with foreign keys. And this is actually, it turns out to be very powerful when we're designing abstractions for machine learning because it allows us to develop a very coherent and consistent user experience on the platform. Right, so that's Hopsworks. Uh, but today, like I said, the focus will be on the feed store up there and how we can use Delta when we develop this feed store. So what is happening now in the space of uh, data lakes is that they're actually starting to resemble more and more like traditional databases. So the frameworks like Delta are adding functionalities that we traditionally associate with databases like indexes to speed up queries, transactions, and record level upsearch and deletes. And you can also notice that it's not only Delta on the slide. There's also a few other frameworks. Even though at this conference it sounds like it's only Delta, but there are a few other options as well. And this just to demonstrate that this is a space with a lot of development going on right now and a lot of innovation. And if we just take a step back here for a minute and ask ourselves the question, why are these three frameworks emerging right now? Like, what is the kind of the current problem that they're solving? And in my opinion, the problem that they're solving is really that the way that we have been managing our data lakes for the past five or 10 years has started to reach its limitations, uh, both in terms of scalability, but more importantly, in terms of usability, where we have very different use cases of our data lakes now than what we had 10 years ago. And the main difference, or my most noticeable difference, is that we have much more use cases that require data in real time or near real time than what we had before. And now I will try to explain how our traditional data leg will be built. I will generalize a little bit, so bear with me. Um, you will have a bunch of production databases that will record your day-to-day -day business transactions. And then uh, on a predefined interval, say um, you know, every night or so, you would have a batch job to just load a snapshot of your data there into your data lake. And once the data is in your data lake, you can use it for offline machine learning and analysis. So this architecture, I like it because it's so simple. It's very little complexity. If the job fails, you can just restart it because it's idempotent, more or less. But the problem with it is that it will severely limit your data latency. Because if this snapshot is large, which it usually is, maybe a few petabytes, then realistically, the time it takes to just write this data to your data lake every time will be at least, you know, if you're using Spark, you're looking at four or five hours, maybe. And this means that no matter how frequently you run this ingesting job, you'll always be bounded by data latency of at least four or five hours. And that doesn't really work if you have a use case that you have, for example, business reports that should be updated based on your data lake every half an hour. Or the use case I'm mostly interested in, what if you have machine learning models in production that should make predictions using fresh feature data? You don't want feature data five hours ago, you want it maybe five minutes ago. And then the follow-up question is, how do we amend this architecture to go from data latency of hours down to minutes? And with data latency, I'm just referring to the latency between a transaction being recorded in your production database and that change being reflected in your data lake. 
So the main insight is that we have to move away from working with entire snapshots every time and instead work with uh, deltas and incrementally apply updates to our data lake. This means that we're moving from a batch job running, say, every night to a streaming job or maybe a mini batch job running very frequently, like every 10 minutes. It also means that we have higher reliability on, on higher guarantees, on, higher, sorry, requirements on reliability. Because since we're not, not longer using entire snapshots, we can't just restart this job every time it fails. We want some kind of guarantees that if the job fails, we are left in a consistent state and we don't lose any data. So ideally, we want ACID transactions. And that's a lot of new requirements that are sort of orthogonal to what traditional uh, data lakes will give you, like HDFS or S3. They will not give you transactions. They will not give you record-level upsurge and deletes. And that's precisely the motivation for frameworks like Delta Lake by Databricks and Apache Hoodie and uh, Iceberg by Netflix. But before I go into these uh, frameworks, I just want to do an example of the two of the main operations that these uh, frameworks are bringing, which are upsurge, which means update or insertion, and time travel. I think that if you understand these two frameworks, you these two operations, you understand kind of the core philosophy of Delta. So in this example, we assume we're using Spark as our data ingestion engine. And we assume that we're running this not in a streaming fashion, but in a mini batch fashion. So every 10 minutes we trigger this job that should take an, a batch of updates that we want to incrementally apply to our data lake. And these updates might be you know, sourced from a change data capture tool that's piped through Kafka or something like that. But that's not really the important part. The important part is just that you realize that we're not using snapshots here. Rather, we have incremental updates that we want to apply to our data lake. And the way I want you to think about it is that every time you run this Spark job, think about it as doing a commit to your data lake. And once you have this mental model of thinking in terms of commits, then it also becomes natural to reason about the state of your data in terms of commit times. So what was the value in my data lake at this point in time? Or what was the value at this point in time? And if you don't have a framework like Delta, that will make sure that every time you make a commit to your data lake, you will do it to a new set of files and keep the old files from previous commits for reference. It means that this is basically called copy and write solution, by the way. This means that you can also do time travel queries. And you can, you can have this kind of temporal queries where you say, what is the value of this particular feature at this particular point in time? And this is what we call time travel operations. And I'll get back to that later on, how we exploit this in our feature store. So Delta is a product by Databricks. And, um, and like I said before, you can think about it as a layer on top of your data lake that brings a bunch of new functionalities like transactions, upsurge, and time travel. And it builds upon a bunch of existing technologies. So it uses Parquet as its file format. It uses uh, Spark as its engine, of course. And it uses existing storage layers like S3 or uh, HDFS. So if you have all of these dependencies in place already, which many do, installing Delta is actually as simple as putting a jar file in your class path. And let's now look at uh, how Delta works internally to provide all of these things. So Delta, in my opinion, is two things. It is a dataset format, and it's also a dataset reader and writer. And dataset format, I think, is the most important one to understand. And from a high-level point of view, a Delta dataset is just a parquet dataset with extended metadata. So in particular, Delta uses what is called log-structured storage, which means that every time you make an update to your data lake, that will be recorded in a transactional log. And this acts as a single source of truth about the value of your data. But the actual data files are still just parquet, so there's nothing really new there. But Delta will, of course, manage these parquet files in particular structure in terms of names and directory structures so that you quickly can look up which files belongs to a certain commit. In addition to the transactional log, Delta also manages metadata about, uh, for speeding up queries. So uh, they have certain indexes, like a said ordered index for speeding up queries, as well as min-max statistics for doing data skipping. And that's the dataset format. And then Delta, like I said, is also a dataset reader and writer. And for ensuring the consistency with Delta, Delta uses what is called optimistic concurrency control, which means that if you have two Spark applications that are running in concurrently or in parallel, and they both try to make operations on the same dataset, if they try to write at exactly the same time, Delta relies on the underlying storage layer to ensure that only one of these operations can succeed. So that you always have this transactional log, you have one commit after another, and you always can reason about the state of your data, so snapshot isolation. And, but what Delta does, instead of failing the operation that didn't succeed, so the append here didn't go through, what Delta will do is that it will optimistically retry that operation. And in 99% of the cases, the user won't even have to be aware there was a failure or conflict to begin with. 
And this is, in my opinion, quite a nice way to manage consistency on big data. And just a final note about Delta before we move on, and that is how it manages its metadata. So, like I said before, Delta manages quite a lot of metadata. There's both the metadata about the transaction and log, but it's also metadata about uh, statistics to speed up these queries. And this metadata is stored in JSON files inside your data sets. But what Delta will do also periodically is that it will compact these JSON files into Parquet files. So now you have your metadata in Parquet, and then you can, of course, process it very scalable with Spark. And this is actually a very elegant solution to a difficult problem, because I think all of you have heard of other methods for managing metadata, like the Hive Meta Store, for example, that everyone has heard war stories, it doesn't really scale. And if you compare that to this approach, it's actually a much more scalable version of managing your metadata. So when you make an operation to a Delta data set, it's basically two steps, where in the first step, Delta will process the metadata using Spark, figure out how to prune the query based on partition or based on commit. And then in the second step, we'll process the actual data files, again using Spark. So it's kind of Spark the whole way, which is, in my opinion, is a very elegant solution. So that was a lot about how Delta works internally and what it will bring you. Um, but like I said in the beginning, Delta is not the only option that you have. There are also other frameworks out there, which are called precisely Apache Hoodie and Apache Iceberg where Hoodie was originally developed by Uber to manage their data lake, and Iceberg was originally developed by Netflix. And the reason I want to mention them is that because they have a lot of overlap with what Delta are solving. They really are in the same domain, and I think it makes sense to mention all of them uh, when you're talking about these frameworks. I will not have time to go into so much details on these, these two, but if you have a question about Hoodie or Iceberg, please leave it to the Q&A at the end. And this is more slide for reference if you want to look it up later on, just a comparison between these two frameworks. And just to summarize this table, these three frameworks really have much more in common than not. They're all based on Spark. They're all using Parquet files in the underlying storage. They're all designed either for HDFS or S3. And all of them bring new functionalities to data lakes, such as transaction, time travel, and upsearch. The main difference between them is that kind of their priorities, where uh, Iceberg was originally developed by Netflix for their S3 data lake, and Hoodie was originally developed by Uber for HDFS. So, if you go into the code base, you kind of understand how the kind of the assumptions they make about the underlying storage are a little bit different. Another difference is, of course, also that Hoodie and Iceberg are two Apache products and have been for quite a while, whereas Delta is still a commercial product by Databricks. So Delta is two versions. There is an open source version, uh, which is a subset of the commercial one. So some of the things that I'll be talking about today, like the optimizations in Delta, are only available in the commercial one and not in the Delta Lake one. And that's also the reason why we in our platform support both Delta and Hood right now, because basically to be sure what happens with the open source versions and so on. And now we get to my final topic of this presentation, which is how we can use these technologies I've been talking about, such as Delta, for building a feed store for machine learning. And when we started building our feed store about uh, over a year ago now, um, it really caught our eyes the development that was going on back then in terms of uh, Hoodie, Delta, and Iceberg. And even though no one really said it explicitly, we, we told ourselves, well, hang on, a lot of these functionalities that they are bringing to data lakes are also things that are very similar to what we are trying to achieve with our feed store. And that's how it came about that we are now using Delta and Hoodie inside our feed store. So this is a product that we have, it's been released in over a year. It was released in end of 2018, and it's been running in production at several of our customers back in Sweden. We also have customers that work in it, with it on the cloud, on AWS or GCP. And just a few months ago, we also have released connectors so that you can use the feed store from a Databricks platform or from uh, Amazon SageMaker, basically as an interface that will manage your data, your complexity around your data from machine learning. And I don't want to go into too much details on how uh, the feed store works internally, um, because I want to keep this focus we have on Delta and Hoodie. But it's, uh, the one thing I can say is just that we store the historical feature data in Hoodie or Delta datasets on our file system. We support both, and the user can decide which one they want to use. And that's why the reason we do that is because it allows us to do a bunch of pretty interesting use cases for a feature store. And the first one is that it allows us to do what we call incremental feature engineering. So before we didn't have Hoodie and Delta, every time our input data set changed, you know, they might be changed daily or hourly or minute on basis, and we wanted to basically, should we recompute our features or not? Every time we recompute our features, our feature pipelines, we have to recompute everything from scratch. Because we didn't know exactly what changed in the data. 
we just have to recompute everything. So, you know, compute aggregations, maybe have some embeddings that you want to compute, or timed windows, all of these features that you're using inside your machine learning pipelines. But then we, when we introduce Hoodie and Delta, the trick here is that then we record the commit time. So I mentioned before this log structured storage in Delta and Hoodie, that you can do time travel operations. So we record the commit time when the features was last computed. And then we want to recompute it. We say, we go to our feature store and say, give me the change log that what have changed since the last time I computed my features. And you get kind of an incremental pool of your data. And based on that, you can then determine which features need to be updated and which ones can I leave as is. So a much more efficient way of computing your features. And this allows us to also be more up to date. So we can run our feature pipelines much more frequently since we know that they will not always run from scratch. We only compute what actually is necessary to compute. And then to a more interesting use case of um, how we are exploiting this time travel operation in Delta and Hoodie inside our feature store for making machine learning experiments reproducible. So we have an experiments tracker similar to MLflow inside the platform where for every experiment that the data scientists will run, we record the hyperparameters that were used, the code, the results, and the input data set or the input features. But when we didn't have Hoodie and Delta, even though we recorded all of that metadata about the experiment, it wasn't truly reproducible because the data changes over time, right? So even if we have the input data set and we try to rerun it, since our experiment depends on the data, we'll get a different result two months later after we ran the original experiment. But what we can do now with Delta and Hoodie is that we can record the commit time since this, this log structured storage. We record the commit time when we last ran the experiment. And then say we want to reproduce an experiment that was produced five months ago. All we have to do is that we go to our feature store and we say, can you give me this list of features exactly how they looked like five months ago when I last ran this experiment? And then if you have this in place and you assume that all other factors are deterministic, you actually have truly reproducible machine learning experiments which I think is something that, yes, in a couple of years, everyone will want this. This is kind of a, um, because machine learning is a very empirical process. You typically do a lot of experimentation until you end up with a model that you're satisfied with. And you, if you can't really be kind of confident that you can reproduce the experiment that you did two weeks ago, I think that will severely kind of hamper your productivity as a data scientist. So that's kind of, this is something that we really uh, feel like is coming more and more, and it's something we have available on our feature store right now. And this is just a glance of how it will look like code-wise to do this kind of time travel operation. This is from our Scala SDK, but we have the same available in Python for doing programmatic um, operations on the feature store. So in the first line, we just insert in the feature store, we create what is called a feature group, just a logical grouping of features. And here we're using Spark, so the user will pass in a Spark data frame, which allows them to add their custom uh, feature engineering on it before they store it to the feature store. And since Spark is lazy, lazy that works very well. Once we have the data in the feature store, since we're storing it with, like I said, Hoodie and Delta, when we want to run, run queries on, to the feature store, you can always have this optional parameter to provide the commit time. So give me this feature as precisely as it looks like at this point in time. And if you don't provide a commit time, it will just give you the latest, latest values. But this is something that once the data scientists kind of get used to this, it becomes really a useful tool to always to be able to go back and say, well, something is up with my experiment, what actually happened, and I can go back in time and say, well, what changed in my data between these two dates, for example. And I realized that was kind of be quite a lot of um, details for, for you guys, if you are not familiar with the technologies I've been talking about, so now I'm gonna do a, a concrete demo to show you how it looks like. And since we are at the Databricks conference, I will do a demo where I will use our feature store from a Databricks notebook running on Databricks platform. But it also, you can also, of course, use the Hopsworks feed store on your own cluster or on SageMaker or any other platform. But let's focus now on um, the Databricks one. Right. Okay. Zoom in a little bit. All right, so now we are in database platform and just a regular no notebook. I guess many of you are familiar with this. All we have to do here is that we're gonna import the Python SDK, so our Python API to the feed store. We have the same one in Scala. So let's do that first. And 
you know, just to clarify how it works, so we have Databricks running this notebook, but our actual Fiji store is running a separate cluster. So the next step, once we've imported our Python uh, API here, we also need to make sure that we can connect to our Fiji store. So that's the second line, where you just have to provide a, um, a host name to where the Fiji store is running. And then we will set up the access rights and everything. And uh, there's a little bit much going on behind the scenes there that I can describe later on. If Databricks doesn't, I hope it will get down soon. Um, okay, while that is loading, I can just go back and show you actually our platform, how the feature store looks like. So I said the feature store runs in a separate cluster, which is here. And this is our whole platform called Hopsworks. And feature store is just one service we have on the platform. But just to repeat what I said in the beginning, this is a platform for scale out data science and machine learning available in the cloud and on prem. Everything inside of this workbench is organized in terms of products, as you can see here. Now I'm going to go into a product where I have a, some demo data from a feature store. And on the left-hand side, you can see the services that we have available. So uh, a bunch of them, but I will focus now on just the feature store, which is one of our services. And the way we like to think about the feature store is almost like an app store for machine learning. It is a place where you collect all of your feature data, you share them with each other, and making collaborative data science actually possible. So this is not something you would use if you're a single data scientist working on your laptop. This is something you would use if you're a large organization, you have teams spread out geographically, and you want to kind of consolidate what features have been computed and able to re reuse them instead of recompute them every time. So for example, here you can go, and you know, some of our customers, they have tens of thousands of these features, so we can search for them. Every time you search something in feature store, we compute a bunch of basic statistics, just so that when they view this feature store or the app store for machine learning, the data scientist should be able to get a quick glance overview of what is the definition of my feature, and then based on that, decide whether they want to use it in their uh, experiment or not. So we also have the distributions over time and a few other basic statistics. You can also add your custom ones if necessary. And basically what we're trying to do here is that we're trying to add kind of software engineering principles to our features. So we version them, as you can see, and we also add a bunch of extra metadata for managing the features. And we also have data validation services. You know, we work with kind of ownership of feature, who actually created it, when was it created. Um, we also link our features to jobs, so can we reproduce this feature? Just go to this. In this case, it was computed by a Spark job, so we can go here, and if you want to reproduce the feature, just press play again. And the main use case that data scientists have of this feature store is that they will go here, browse from features, find some features that they think are useful for their model or their experiment. Then to actually use it, we have integrations with machine learning frameworks. So they will go here, click on Create Train the Reset, select the features they would like, and add some metadata. Add some metadata about that. Specify the dataset format. So we have integrations with all of the existing kind of machine learning frameworks. So most of our users are using TensorFlow, so TF Records is the common one. Click Create, and that will then generate a Spark job that will read from the feature store and dump that out into a training dataset that you can use for doing machine learning experiments. So, of course, this is how you do it from the UI. Uh, I know not everyone likes this. You can do exactly the same thing from the API itself. You'll say, give me this list of features, create a training dataset from them. Let's now have a look if Databricks is up. Yes, all right, so let's connect to our feed store. We are now connected, and now we have the full uh, power of our entire uh, feed store API. This is actually a very rich API, so we'll just go over the basic operations, which are, of course, read and write operations to the feed store. So we can, we can get feature groups by name. And you can see also we pass the online flag here. That's because we have different storage layers for uh, training data, offline data, and online data for model serving. So our online feed store supports uh, milliseconds query latency if you have mo models in production that needs to qu query the feature store for some aggregates for making predictions. You also can specify a list of feature names, and then we have a query planner behind this feature store that will figure out how to fetch the features and how to join them together and turn you the features, features as a joined uh, data frame. Like that. You can also query a bunch of metadata operations and do visualizations of features. The one I just showed you in the UI is also available in notebook form. And yes, that was how you can use our feature store, Hopsworks feature store from a database platform. And a feature store, just to repeat, is a 
data man management layer for machine learning to basically democratize ac access to feature data and make it reproducible. And now, just have a summary slide. So machine learning right now is um, kind of disrupting every aspect of our industry, and it's an extremely powerful tool. But it also comes with quite a high complexity and technical depth. And our solution for managing this complexity, or at least reducing it, is to invest in a data management layer specifically designed for machine learning called a feature store. And in this presentation, I've argued for that a feature store can benefit a lot from being built on technologies like Databricks Delta, Apache Hoodie, and Apache Iceberg. And the world's first open source feed store since 2018 is available on our platform. And it's, you can use it on cloud or in on-prem. And everything is open source. So please, if you have a look on GitHub, if you want to check out the code, or if you want enterprise support, uh, let me know, and we can send, set something up. And with that, uh, thank you very much for listening. And now I'm open for questions. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> questions. Thank you for your interesting presentation. Um, from my understanding, uh, a feature store stores features that can be assembled to uh, provide the right data set for the right experiment, right? Yeah. OK, uh, so I have two questions. The first one is that um, I think that will imply managing the feature store uh, from the organization uh, part. And secondly, uh, how to make sure that um, features selected are um, convenient and are consistent. Compatible. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Because uh, if we think of, uh, let's say, a, a big organizations with, uh, uh, let's say, hundreds, if not thousands, of possible dimensions, uh, how to, uh, if I'm a data scientist, I'm trying to figure out uh, what are the features that are needed to uh, train my model. I would like to select this one and this one and this one, but maybe they would not be compatible between uh, each other. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's very good questions. So the first one was about uh, how do we manage in the organization kind of the feed store, like from a management or operations perspective, as I understood it. And that's a good question because it's not like you install a feed store and then suddenly your machine learning pipelines will be you know, applying software engineering principles and they will just work very well. You have to kind of educate your data science and data engineers to use it properly. And one such thing is that don't use it as a, just a data lake. You just dump everything in and then you, you clean it up later. We have a kind of data validation layer in front so that everything needs to pass certain data validation metrics before it's even allowed in the feed store. And we also rely heavily on this kind of encouraging this kind of ownership of feature data. So the data engineer that actually wrote the pipeline and computed the features ultimately is the owner of the feature data. And this means the data scientists, if they find that the features are not uh, useful or there's some broken thing with them, they can reach out to the data engineer to kind of iteratively fix this up. The second one, the second question was about how do we manage features that maybe are not compatible with each other. Like if you have a feature store of thousands of features, how do you even know like, how they can be joined together and make chain data sets for machine learning experiments? That's another good question. And this is also something that there's no magic here. We have to kind of, uh, kind of require our data engineers when they publish features to the feature always to note uh, their primary keys in, the, in this feature group. So it can be a, joint, a composite key or a single key. And then we have this query planner in place that will give suggestions how we can join features together based on these primary keys. But ultimately, if the data engineers don't really just dump data in and don't have a, even think about how this will be joined with other features. Like if you're a bank, if you have transactional features, you have user features, if the one that computes the features doesn't think about how they join them together so they are incompatible, then you have a problem. So this is also something that kind of evolves gradually. Um, and yeah, I think that answered the last one as well. Yeah, yeah f uh, first of all, it looks amazing. So congratulations, a nice presentation also. Uh, two questions. First is Airflow, uh, how you integrate it and why, and sort of how that thing works. And the second is Lineage, if you integrated a Pasha Atlas or some Lineage tools. Yes, uh, good point. So let's go back to the first slide. But um, Airflow. So, um, like I said, we have Airflow for organizing pipelines in our feed store. And we have this kind of mindset since everything is built around a distributed fund system. 
we think about the machine learning pipeline as going in different steps. And all of them synchronize with the file system or the feed store, which ultimately is powered by the file system. So you have one job that maybe cleans the data, then you have a job that maybe inserts it in the feed store, a second one that creates a training data set, and a fourth one that trains the model, and a fifth one that deploys it. And all of this is separate modules in our, in our pipelines that are organized by Airflow. And we have our own fork of Airflow just to make it compatible with kind of everything else in our platform. And we also support here both running um, you know, Python jobs, like regular PySpark jobs, uh, Beam jobs, Flink. But what we see now is coming more and more with our users that we also support running notebooks as jobs. So data scientists or engineers might kind of hack something together in a notebook and then instead of always taking this extra step, which sometimes is necessary to kind of compute it down into some script or something, you can actually run the notebook itself as a job which is something that we support on the platform. First of all, it was a great presentation. Uh, how do you actually differentiate uh, that there could be like, when you ingest the data, there could be a categorical feature and it could be a continuous feature. And the aggregate methods that you actually put on over there, like, you know, average or some min max, they apply to the continuous features, which are mostly numerical. And how do you, how do you actually classify the features? That's my first question. And the second question is, do you do any feature engineering based on the windowing function, say in the last three months, in the last six months, in the last 18 months, like that? Uh, yeah, good questions. So the first one was basically how we categorize our feature data. So numeric, categorical, how does that relate to, to aggregations and so forth. And the important thing here, like this is bites back to the, another question before, that it's not like you just dump all the data in the feature store. Like only the features that you actually think will be used to training a machine learning model should go in the feature store. And this means that you might have a bunch of uh, data sets that, that sits before your feature store, maybe in your traditional data lake. And that's may maybe when you have like, your, like, your raw data sets and then you uh, kind of transform them into a format that you can actually apply machine learning directly. That's the idea with the feature store. And regarding numeric, categorical, uh, the feature store will not give you like out of the box, like give your pipelines this kind of, uh, like solve this for you. This is more, you have to have, like a lot of the functionalities here it's just tools that needs to be used by data engineers that knows you know, the difference between a categorical and numeric and how they rely in a feature store in a machine learning pipeline and so forth. So it's really up to the data engineer and this is just the tools that we bring to kind of fit everything together. But ultimately it's your job to write the Spark uh, job to compute the features or a Flink job if you prefer that and then push it in the feature store. The second one was about um, if you use the windowing functions and that's also similar to what I said. So we have, we just rely on the user providing in a data frame, which can be a Spark or a Flink kind of data frame. And then we save that to the feature store and figuring out where to write the data, how to analyze it for statistics and how to publish the metadata. But the actual feature engineering is kind of free totally for the data engineer. We don't impose any kind of guarantees or requirements on how you define your features. It's up to the data scientist. The only thing that we have is that you have the possibility to add a data validation step before the, to basically as a gatekeeper before anything goes on in the feature store. And if it fails, we publish the, the, the broken feature data to a temporary storage instead. Yes, we, we rely heavily on this hoodie and delta thing to have this point in time correctness at all stages. Yes. So the question he asked was, when you do this kind of data validation steps and verify if data should go in the feature store and maybe go to some temporary storage, do you use this point in time thing? And that's exactly what we do. We rely on Hoodie and Delta heavily here to always kind of reason about our data in terms of commits so that we can have this kind of uh, historical data. And since data storage is cheap, we encourage actually to not clean up the old commits, at least keep like six months or a year so that we have this functionality that's always going back in time and reasoning about how data changed and kind of amending things that went wrong. And uh, is there any facility, uh, this is like in a wide enterprise wide feature store, how do I put that to my specific use case? Uh, my specific use case could be balance of a customer A today, customer A tomorrow, and I'd like to do windowing functions on each of those dates, uh, backtracking on each day that's given in the use case. Is it possible to do that with this Hopsworks feature store? Yes, so that's exactly. So the question is basically how does it fit into my particular use case if I have certain type of data structure? And uh, that's exactly what it does. This is just the tools, but then we have, you have fitted together. It's very flexible tools that you can use for basically really all types of data you can like. Everything that you can process with Spark or Flink, you can also manage in the feed store. And concretely, when we have customers that have such a use case, we usually run these kind of workshops to kind of get the, get the workflow started and setting up the best practices for actually managing the feature data. Because if you're used to working in a different way, I understand this is kind of a new way of working with it and it can take some time to get used to it. But we don't see any limitations in 
porting this framework to whatever kind of data model that you're using. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very nice presentation. Um, I just want to ask you, this feature store um, idea, having made the data on the features, reminds me about the uh, area of data cataloging, which is coming from the uh, BI space, basically, where now lots of vendors are coming up with kind of uh, metadata management systems where you, uh, where, you, uh, where you annotate your business meanings and meanings, semantic annotations of all these features. So actually kind of link between these two worlds of this feature store and these uh, data catalogs would be also some uh, benefit, um, some thoughts on this. Yeah, I think that's also a good point. Like how does the feature store, this functionality of kind of making high abstractions on your data relate to traditional data catalog systems or BI tools? And that's exactly what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do with the feature store is basically to make a feature store, uh, sorry, a feature, a machine learning feature, a first class citizen inside your data lake. So uh, we add in this high level of abstraction on top of your data lake, if you like, where we're also trying to apply software engineering principles. So always version your data, there should be a data validation step there, there should be metadata, you know, ownership of features, statistics about them. That's kind of so that you really care about the feature data. It's not something that you just dump to some storage and then you reuse it for machine learning experiments and then everyone forgets what it is. Rather, everything that goes in the feature store is kind of available to the entire organization and then that becomes like a catalog, if it's a feature catalog, you can say.